Welcome to the Universe in a Seashell, the podcast dedicated to science, life, and girl power. I'm Kara Bartek, and I'm your host. I'm a PhD, an author, and I want to make this world a more equal and opportune place, one girl at a time. in a seashell. Today we're going to be talking all things girls, science, and life. I'm your host, Kara Bartek, and I also have a very special co-host with me. Her name is Cece. Cece, do you want to say hi? Hi. Okay, I'm going to take some time to introduce her in just a second, but I wanted to cover a few things briefly. I wanted to let you know exactly where you can find the podcast. First and foremost, you can find us on Podbean, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or anywhere else that you get your podcast. Now, please remember to subscribe, rate us, and leave a review because guess what? Your opinion matters. Not only is it great feedback for the podcast, but it really raises our visibility level. So we totally appreciate us. Remember, subscribe, rate, and review. Um, Because don't forget, this podcast is all about making this world a more equal and opportune place, one girl at a time. And I can't do that alone. I need your help. You can also find me on social media. You can find me on Facebook at Kara Bartek Author. And you can also find this podcast on its very own Facebook page, and that's just Universe in a Seashell. I'm on Instagram at Kara Bartek. I'm on Twitter, which I don't really use Twitter all that much. I need some help on Twitter. So if anyone out there can give me some Twitter tips, I'm totally open. Oh, and I also have Snapchat, which actually Cece's over here laughing at me a lot right now. Okay. (laughs) Why are you laughing, Cece? <laughs> am I am I way too old to be using Snapchat? <laughs> you hardly ever use it. Okay, but the filters are really cool, right? Yeah, but you we hardly can the, use it. We can get those kitty cat ears, and then we have that one that like, makes us look like really gross old men. But anyway, I need help on how to use Snapchat. So please, drop me a line. Let me know. How am I supposed to use Snapchat? Um... You, if you have suggestions for the show, maybe there's a topic you'd like to know more about. Um, there's potentially a guest that you want to hear from, or maybe you just have something really cool to say. Drop me a line at universe in a seashell at gmail.com. Again, that address is universe in a seashell at gmail.com. And those emails come directly to me. Um, don't forget to tell your friends, share a link. Post a link, but most importantly, never quit talking about science. Okay, so I'm going to quit talking about how to get in touch with me, and I'm going to start talking about all things girls and science, because this is our very first show, and that's what we're all about, right? We're about girls, life, and science. So we're going to be talking about things that are really important to girls. We're going to be talking about things that are really important to girls' lives, and obviously science because we all love science right do you love science cc yes okay can you please tell us a little bit about yourself well i live in a rent house right now so i don't my room is kind of messy right now so but wait a second even when we haven't lived in rent houses your room is always messy um but right now it's really messy yeah it's terrible we're actually recording this episode from her very messy room (laughs) And I'm afraid that something's going to leap out from beneath the, to- the toys and bite me. <laughs> I'm sorry that it's too messy. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Well, how old are you, Cece? I'm seven years old. Okay, so what are some of your favorite things? Like your favorite color, favorite food, favorite TV show? My favorite food is spaghetti. Spaghetti? <laughs> <laughs> she makes some mean spaghetti. I say that. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> And my favorite color is turquoise. 
Okay. Favorite color is turquoise. I like turquoise. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a mermaid color, right? Yes, it is. Okay, so do you love science? I love science. Okay, what is it that you love about science? Science can give you information about whatever you want to know. Like, people people who want to learn about dinosaur bones, they're called paleontologists, they they teach us about what it used to be like in the time where dinosaurs lived. And yeah. it's pretty cool to learn about stuff that was behind you. And it takes scientists to really understand that kind of information, yes, right? Yes, without scientists, we wouldn't know anything about our past. That's true, that's true. Just like, okay... When we were reading that book, and they said that there's a strong possibility that dinosaurs had feathers. Okay. Yes, they're related to birds because of their backbone, I think, or something. Yeah, there's there's a bunch of different relationships. Even they were pointing out that the T-Rex kind of looked like a giant chicken, which was <laughs> kind of shocking <laughs> to me. Did they lay giant eggs? <laughs> <laughs> they may have, but, you know, I think, I don't know, I think. Yeah, I think a lot of but the I dinosaurs... But I think they live birth. T-Rexes did? Sure. Yeah. Well, I do know there were a lot of dinosaurs that had eggs, just kind of like crocodiles and turtles and stuff like that, which obviously I is just like birds. I know a few that laid eggs. So. Yeah. so anyway, but we're getting off topic. Yes. But I have a very important question for you. Mm -hmm. So if you like science, do you like science jokes? Of course I do. Okay, I've got one for you. Are you ready? <laughs> yes. Okay, why do tigers have stripes? Why? So they don't get spotted. Because <laughs> <laughs> they have stripes instead of spots. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a dumb joke. Okay, but you have a science joke for me too, though, right? Yes. If okay. y'all can guess this, say it, please. What is a great white shark's favorite candy? Uh, gummy sharks? No. <laughs> what is it? Jawbreakers. <laughs> that's pretty good. I like that. Because they have big jaws and they like to break stuff. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I get it. I totally get it. I totally get it. Okay, enough science jokes. Let's talk about our topic at hand, yes. which this week's talk topic is all about science and in particular science jokes. Okay, so... I obviously love science. I love science kind of the same reasons that you do. It gives us information, but one of the reasons that it's very important for me is because it's something that can truly change the world. It can. Yeah, it totally can. You know, scientists are behind some of our major innovations in technology. Um, they're the folks that are innovating um, with healthcare, agriculture. It, the list goes on and on. They're basically help behind everything that we have yeah but the main thing is that they teach us about what we need to know yeah. like they basically teach teachers yeah. to teach us yeah they do they absolutely do okay but the but one thing that I want to talk about is something that bothers me and I know it bothers you um Cece and I spent a lot of years living very close to the beach so the I know plastic exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, plastic in the ocean. Okay, now this is this is a big issue. Okay. So here in the news recently, like within the past few months, there have been a several reports of whales that seem completely healthy being beached. Um, and you know what beaching means. It means Yes, it means they're stuck on land. Yeah. And they usually do that if they're sick or if they're dying. Okay? Mm -hmm. So anyway, so they had marine biologists come in and examine exactly why these, what they thought were very healthy whales, why they would be beaching. And what they discovered is their stomachs were filled with plastic. Because they feed on tiny krill and stuff, and they suck in water. And there's plastic in the water, so they suck that in. Exactly. So they're sucking in that plastic. And the problem with that is, is the plastic is not passing through. So their stomach is getting filled up with all of this junk and they can't get the nutrition that they need. And what ends, what ends up happening? They get, they end up getting beached. Yeah. They're dying, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So 
you know, plastic bags. You already mentioned that, you know, whales are the type of feeders that they just suck in a huge bunch of ocean water. They're getting the plankton, they're getting the krill, they're getting all of those very small sea creatures, and at the same time, they're sucking up all that junk. Um, but there's another problem with plastic, in particular plastic bags. When they're in the water, they look like jellyfish. And turtles love jellyfish. Exactly. Turtles love jellyfish. And so what happens when they do it? They eat it, and it clogs up their stomachs. And sometimes they, this is like, I, I hate this to say this, but they also get caught in nets, like baby ones, and they, they like choke, and sometimes they die if people don't find them. That's very true, that's very true. But you know, do you remember when we were at the aquarium, yes. and they were talking to us about seeing debris for example like plastic bottles on the beach and a lot of times you'll see what looks like triangle chunks taken out of them okay so it's like there's a regular bottle and for whatever reason there are these chunks that look like triangles that are that are, have been taken out of these bottles and what what ends up happening what that is a sign of is a sea turtle bite and they're eating it, and sea turtles' beaks are shaped like... T they're triangles, right. Yes. Yeah, so, so if you don't know, you know, sea turtles have not a regular mouth. They have a little beak mouth, and they will actually bite this way. So anyway, the point is, is we've got a lot of our sea creatures ingesting uh, this plastic trash. So I'm going to read you some facts that I found about the plastic waste. Okay. Every year, 8 million metric tons of plastic waste enter the ocean. Okay, now, that's hard to fathom, because do you know what a metric ton is? I've heard a little bit about it, but not really, because I'm in, only in third grade. Okay, well, so, and it's, it's hard to imagine something that large, because when you think of a ton, are you thinking like an elephant? Are you thinking a whale? Are you thinking something that weighs as much as a, a rent house or all the junk in your room? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe not. Oh, well, wait a second. Wait a second. So what I have here are some facts and figures, and I pulled this off of the Smithsonian Institute website. Uh -huh. So basically, 8 million metric tons of plastic waste being dumped into the ocean is the equivalent of a garbage truck dumping a load into the water every minute. Every single minute? Every minute. A garbage truck holds, like, tons. Right. Think about how large garbage trucks are and all of the things that they hold. They're pretty heavy if you put them on a giant scale. Oh, very, very heavy. Including the truck itself. Right. But we're just talking about the loads. Yes. Okay, now here's some other facts and figures. These are basically comparisons. 8 million metric tons is the same as 822,000 Eiffel Towers. Okay, you've seen the Eiffel Tower. I've actually been to the Eiffel Tower. It's, I've seen some pictures of it, yeah. but I've never been. Okay, well, I've been, and it's, it's stinking tall. It's hot dog stinking tall. Okay, it's I've really, heard, really tall. I've heard from people that it's pretty, pretty tall. And I don't think you could pick it up. No. So the plastic waste equivalent is 822,000 of these towers. Now, wait a second. I'm not done. It's also the equivalent of 25,000 Empire State Buildings. Now, you know where the Empire State Building is, right? Forgot. <laughs> it's in New York. Okay. Now, it's not the tallest building in North America, but it's very, very close. And I've seen that. I saw that back when I was in high school. The building is so tall that when you stand next to it and you lift your head up, you can't see the top. And it's brick, steel, concrete. And the amount of plastic entering the ocean is equivalent to 25,000 of those buildings. Also, it's equivalent to 80 million blue wells or 1 billion elephants. I think the most is one billion. Yeah. That's, that's like, I can't believe that that much trash is going into our precious but it's ocean. Not, it's not just trash. It's plastic waste. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about plastic. There's also estimated to be 51 trillion 
pieces of microplastics in the ocean. Now microplastics is basically defined as little tiny pieces of plastic. Okay, that can mean that it's plastic that's been degraded from a larger plastic source, or it can also be things that are put in some of our hygiene products, like our skincare products, our shampoos, our toothpastes. A lot of times manufacturers will put these beads in there to kind of work as an abrasive, to basically get us clean. But what's happening is they're actually very bad for the ocean. Okay. To put this into perspective, 51 trillion pieces of microplastic, that's more than the stars in the Milky Way. So we've, we've, we've gone outside and we've seen the night sky. I right? think, isn't the stars infinity because die more, die more, and then they keep on going? But I'm just talking about in the Milky Way. That's just, just our galaxy. Just in the Milky Way? Right. So that's a lot. Okay. To date, 6.3 trillion metric tons of plastic have been produced, okay? Now, the plastic is getting into our oceans through several different means. It can be coming through our wastewater, like I talked about with the hygiene products. So when we use those plastic abrasives that are in our toothpaste, on our face washes, things like that, it can come through our wastewater. It could also just be river runoff. So, you know, you and I have driven by rivers... Um, and other streams and things like that. And we see a lot of garbage on the side. Colorado River and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, we see a lot of, um, you know, cans, bottles, all of that kind of stuff. Well, that stuff actually gets pushed out into the ocean because that's, in general, that's where all of these rivers lead to. Um, natural disasters. So during hurricanes, for example, remember we went through Harvey and there was a lot of flooding that happened in Harvey. And what happens is a lot of that waste gets picked up, put out in the ocean. There's also the instance of direct dumping. So it's been known. Right. I know. You, Cece looks pretty shocked. Um, Please don't tell me that people just take their trash and throw them in the ocean. Yes, they do. And littering. That's what, that's what littering is, okay? I basically know what littering is. But just throwing your trash in the ocean on purpose? Yes, there's... There's actually some, some municipalities and different countries that have been caught illegally dumping. It is against the law. However, it still happens. The law is just a set of rules. That doesn't mean people won't break it. Now, here's, here's the deal with plastic. Plastic never actually goes away. You know, it takes about 450 years and it will break into those tiny little pieces. But once they form the tiny little pieces, they're still there. Um, and when they go into these teeny tiny little pieces, it may become even more toxic and even more deadly because it's easier to digest. Oh, yeah, because whales are feed on plankton and those are like as tiny as plankton. And also think about the cleanup aspect of it. So it's easier to fish out large pieces of plastic from water than it is those teeny tiny little beads, right? Teeny tiny pieces. It's really hard. How would you get that out of the bottom of the ocean? Because you have the tiny pieces of sand and then you also are going to have these tiny pieces of plastic. How do you know the difference? Because they might look the same because the product that they might have come off was brown and the sand's brown. No. Can't tell. It's hard. It's hard. Okay, so 60 to 90% of all of our ocean garbage is plastic. And it's evident there's these two big things. So you know how ocean currents work, right? Yes. So the wind basically moves the, the, the ocean around, and, and they move in these regular patterns. And so the currents affect the migration of a lot of our sea creatures, it affects the way that boats navigate, all that kind of good stuff. Well, guess what it also affects? It affects the way that trash blows around. We have so much trash and plastic in our oceans that there are two huge, huge collections of plastic waste. One is called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Now, that's on, that's in the Western Pacific Ocean, that's kind of near Asia. There's also an Eastern collection, and that's near California. It's just called the Eastern Garbage Patch. I have seen and, and read that there are estimates that the, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, that first one that's kind of on that, that Western side of the Pacific Ocean, 
is as large as Texas. Texas is pretty large. Do you remember how long it used to take us to drive from Lubbock to, to College house? Station? Yeah. And to our grandma's house? Yeah. That's, Jeez. And we weren't even going across the entire state. So that's that's huge. Now, let's let's talk specifics on how this affects ocean life. So you already you already briefly mentioned how it can tangle up sea turtles, right? So, you know, fishing lines, discarded nets, all of those things, they can, they can tangle or they can even cut some of our ocean life, in particular coral. Now, what happens when that, you know, the, the ocean life could actually be strangled if it were to get around something, you know, very sensitive like a gnat. Um, there can be things called amputations. Um, Cece and I used to go to an aquarium in, in Corpus Christi called the Texas State Aquarium. And it housed a lot of rescue animals. And the, the sea turtles that they would house a lot of times couldn't be released back into the wild because they had amputations. So they'd only have three flippers. And a lot of times those amputations occurred because of these this plastic netting, these strings being out there and, and, and cutting off the circulation of their flippers. And they could no longer... Navigate as well and as there was one that I felt really bad about because it lost a flipper and it also lost an eye. Yeah, there's a, so you know this has a lot of impact. Now, when when sea life gets cut, this also leads leaves them open for infection and disease. Okay, so that's another way. Now, if they ingest the plastic, we've already talked about it, like with the whales, that can lead their bodies to basically starve. They're not going to get the nutrients. They're not going to get the, the, the proteins, the fats, all of those things that they need to survive to feed their bodies, to feed their cells. Um, and they end up dying essentially of starvation. And like you said earlier, sometimes it gets clogged in their throats and stuff. And if they try to eat, the food will get clogged up again. So, and it can't go through to their stomachs. So they can't digest it, and then that leads to them dying. Yeah, it's problems all around. Now, and I think a lot of times when we think about the way that ocean waste impacts sea life, we just think about the big mammals like whales, dolphins, you know, all of the big creatures, sea lions, um, and then obviously the fish. But don't forget about the small creatures, um, the turtles, the the, the coral reefs, krill, shrimp, plankton, they all live in a greater ecosystem and they're all equally affected by this. Because you can imagine a, a, a an animal as big as a whale um, not having their, their food source out there. You know, if the microplastics are affecting the krill and the plankton and all of that kind of good stuff, it's it's a kind of a never-ending cycle. So, in in and not to be a Debbie Downer, but this is the reality of what we're facing. Now, how does science impact this? Now, what scientists are doing every day is they're innovating different solutions to try to make our ocean a cleaner and safer place, not only for us, but for the animals that, that live in there. So I wanna tell you about a girl named Anna Dew, who is doing just that. Now, she's a 12-year-old inventor from Massachusetts, and she was walking along a, a beach there, and she was stunned by the amount of microplastics that she saw. She, she took this and her shock at, at, at the, the sheer amount of microplastics and her feelings of not knowing exactly what to do. How, how could you sift through all of this sand? How could you do this for an entire coastline, not to mention an ocean in the entire world? How could you really begin to remediate our oceans with all of this plastic? She was called to action through that, okay? She is actually one of the 30 finalists in the Broadcom Masters competition. This is one of the top science, technology, engineering, and math, that's STEM, contest for young students in the world. And this competition is organized by the Broadcom Foundation and Society for Science and, and the Public, and it's been running for eight years. Okay, and in this competition, there are nearly 5,000 
middle schoolers that enter. Okay, so that's sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. Now, she's one of, so if there's 5,000, she's one of the 30 finalists. Think about how amazing her invention must be. Are you ready to hear about it? Okay. So what she did is she invented a robot to help sense where microplastics are. Okay. And what, what it is, it's an ROV that's a remotely operated vehicle. Do you know what that is? Yes. Okay, so it's basically like a robot that moves around in an area where people can't typically go, right? So it would make sense if a human can't get somewhere, especially like the bottom of the ocean, because I'm not really good at breathing underwater, are you? I can only hold it for like a few minutes. Yeah, and so if you had to get under there and find all these tiny pieces of plastic, you would really need some help, right? Maybe like with a robot. Okay, so she made this ROV, this remotely operated vehicle, which is basically a robot with PVC pipes. She was inspired by other remotely operated ve vehicles, just like the Curiosity that landed on the surface of Mars. So NASA said, hey, we want to figure out what's going on in Mars. Are there Martians? Cece <laughs> You're so interested in aliens. Oh, that's a different topic. I love aliens. But but anyway, so NASA really did. They wanted to know what Mars was all about. They wanted to know what the topography looked like. They wanted to know what kind of rocks were up there, what the atmosphere was like. And they knew they couldn't send a person, so they sent this ROV vehicle. Stand out from the sand and the plant life. So if you can imagine this sensing system kind of scanning the bottom of the ocean and the way that she created the technology is that the microplastics basically glow. That's the way that they look. So they're very, very apparent, okay? She also uses, uses visible light to spot unnatural colors that make the plastics stand out. This apparatus doesn't actually collect the microplastics, but it allows people to identify where they are accumulating. So this is one piece in the chain in getting the stuff out of our oceans. Now here's the cool part, and this is coming directly from the article, because we're, at least I'm kind of thinking, man, this is a 12 year old girl. How old are you, Cece? I'm almost eight. <laughs> almost eight? Okay, and I'm 37. <laughs> I'm so old and gross, right? But anyway. So she's going to be 38, so. <laughs> but I think that this is such a cool thing for a 12-year-old to invent. She was only 12. She's, she's only 12. And so this the, this shows you. Basically, anything can be done. But, but let me read to you what, what she credits this to. She, she says her parents, who for years have been taking her to MIT's, which she lives in Boston, so MIT is actually a, a, a university up near the, the Boston, Massachusetts area, and it's very, very well known for their science, engineering, and technology. It's probably one of the leaders when it comes to... Um, advanced engineering. Um, but anyway, she says her parents have for years been taking her to this university, MIT's student outreach activities on the weekends. They constantly fostered her and supported her, in particular, her interest in STEM. She's been able to meet other students and science, scientists there, and as a result, her sight set on attending the university and becoming an engineer. So basically what she did is she, she had a passion she had a concern, right? She's walking along the beach and she saw all of these microplastics in the sand and she said, hey, what am I gonna do about it? And she used her experiences, she got support from her parents, and that's what she did. She's probably no different from you or from me other than her passion and her interests, right? Okay, this is a quote from Anna. I know I want to be an engineer because I like building things to help solve world problems, but I'm not sure what kind of engineer I want to be yet. 
She's got some time to decide, right? She was only 12 when she invented that. <laughs> she's still 12. Yeah, so she's got some time. So uh, now, I want to tell you about two other women who are a little bit older than Anna, but they're also using science to help the world's ocean. So Jenny Yao and her friend Miranda Wang have co-founded a company called BioSelection. Now, when I say the word selection, you're probably thinking selection with an S, right? Like if you were to go and select a dessert. What dessert would you select, Cece? Would it be cake, pudding, ice cream? Ice cream cake. <laughs> ice cream cake? Okay, so anyway, but this bioselection is very different. This is bioselection spelt C-E-L-L-E-C-T-I-O-N, like a cell, okay? Um, they recently won Toyota's 25th Mother of Invention Awards, okay? Jenny and Miranda met when they were 17 years old and they were in high school. They were actually part of the high school's recycling club. And what they noticed is that by visiting the local rivers and streams that the bacteria had adapted to degrade plastics. So they weren't necessarily completely eating up the plastics. What they were doing is they were metabolizing the plastics to the point where they were a little bit easier to handle. Now, why would this be important. So basically what bioselection is all about is about dealing with the complicated nature of plastic these days. So we all recycle plastics, right? That's something easy to do. But what a lot of people don't understand is the process that's involved in recycling plastic. It has to be broken down into particular materials that are easier to use in different products like new sunglasses, new bottles, new toys. Well, it's not as easy as just sticking it into a machine. A lot of times these plastics need to be degraded. So that's what Ginny and Miranda have done, is they have created a bacteria and a process for degrading our current plastic to a material that's easier to recycle. And I think that's pretty cool. What do you think about that? Well, what do you see in common with those two stories that I told you? They both wanted to help out the wildlife. Yeah, they both, they wanted, both to... wanted to save the sea. They both wanted to help while they both wanted to help make the plastic. They both wanted to... <laughs> I keep repeating. You're good. <laughs> They both wanted to try to help stop the plastic pollution. Yeah, they both have that same passion. But what do you notice about the people themselves? Are they... What, what is this podcast all about? Girls. Girl power, right. Okay, so, and there are two really stories that are focused on girl scientists. So, and I think that's really cool because here's the deal. You know mom's real concerned about girls in science, right? You are. Because there's a perception out there that, you know, boys are better at science than girls. And I think that that's something that starts very young. Because the reality is, is there is a gap in the STEM fields. And you're probably kind of going, what exactly do you mean by a gap? Do you know what I mean by a gap? Long space. Long space, yeah. And so when I say there's a gap, what I mean is there's not as many girls doing science, doing engineering, inventing technologies, inventing really cool things that detect microplastics or bacteria that degrade plastics out there as there are boys. Because a lot of times people think that boys are better at science than girls. I'm going to read you some of the statistics that I pulled that kind of back up this gap that I'm talking about. Okay, 35.2% of chemists are women. Only 11.1% of physicists and astronomers are women. 33.8% of environmental engineers. 22.7% of chemical engineers. 
17.5% of civil, architectural, and sanitary engineers are women. 17.1% are industrial engineers. 10.7% are electrical or computer engineers. And 79 are mechanical engineers. Now, those numbers seem bad, but the gap is closing in certain fields, especially like social sciences and medical sciences. So those are all good signs. Now, the gap seems to start to happen somewhere between the ages of 9 and 13. So that's getting pretty close to where you're at, right? Um, after I turn 8, after a whole half of a year, I'm going to be 9, so... Well, and here's the deal, is that girls and boys basically test the same. But there are different problems that happen that seem to be making this gap occur. For example, social pressure. So what do you think I mean when I say social pressure? Can you tell me? <laughs> well, a lot of times, okay, so when you're good at something like science or math, Sometimes you could get called a nerd or maybe people make fun of you like everybody makes fun of me just because I love aliens and love Bigfoot. You have a shirt. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, when I was your age and I really loved science and I was all about it, sometimes I got called a nerd and that hurt my feelings a lot of times. And so what I would do is I would pretend that I didn't like it as much. Well, what happens if you pretend that for a long time? You start not liking it. Yeah, you could start not liking that. There's also a lot of stereotypes that exist out there. Do you know what I mean when I say stereotype? And I think that if someone still if, you, if someone calls you that, you shouldn't hide who you truly are. Yeah, you shouldn't. But sometimes it's not so easy for people to do. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about stereotypes about science. Sometimes people think that science is hard. Why would people think science is hard, Cece? Science takes a lot of brain thinking and math, which I hate. <laughs> <laughs> brain thinking? <laughs> yeah, oh, brain. that thing in between? Okay, I gotcha, I gotcha. Yeah, a lot of people think that science is very difficult. Now, in my experience, science is very exciting. Because you get to learn stuff. You get to learn stuff. You get to experience new things. Sometimes people also think that science is boring. Who think that? Well, sometimes if maybe you have a teacher that's difficult, or maybe there's a particular subject, a lot of times it can be very intimidating, right? Okay. And then also, a lot of it has to do with what your friends think about science, right? If your friends like something, don't you want to try to like that too, enjoy it, have something in common with them? Yeah. Yeah. But sometimes it's good to do the stuff that you like. It is good. It is good. But it's not always that easy. Yes. Right? There's a phrase that old gross adults say, which is simple but not easy. That means it's very simple to think about those but things that we're talking about, but not easy to do. Okay, so I've got a call to action, okay? So I think that there are three very basic things that we can do that we get a lot more girls interested in science, doing science, and making science rock. What? Okay, okay, are you ready? Yes. Okay, love the world. Number one, love the world, okay? This is very simple. Love the world around you. Love nature. Love animals. Appreciate it. Go out on a dark night when there's a meteor shower. Look at the stars. Look at the sky. Do you remember when we saw the blood we moon eclipse? We did that a lot. When yes. we, but it was hard when we lived in the city because all those stupid lights were going on. Yes, yes. Light pollution is an issue. But the point is, is that the world around us is science, right? Science is that way of understanding our stars, our moon, our sky, the animals around us, our world. And when we can love this world, we by default love science, right? If you love the world, you love science. If you love the world, you love science. So that's if number one. If you love the world, you love science. That's number one. Number two, commit to working hard in school. This is not an easy one. This is, this is a simple not easy. Because I... 
am going to be the first person to tell you this. Excelling in science is not about how smart you are. It is about how hard you work. I believe that almost everybody can understand scientific concepts by just applying themselves. Do you believe me, Cece? Yes. What did I say about multiplication? Wait, I can't hear you, Cece. What did I say about multiplication? You said if I try it, I will get better at it when if, I try it. And you tried it, and what happened? And I learned it. And you're pretty good at multiplication, aren't you? Yes, I am. <laughs> and that proves my point that if you apply yourself at something, you'll get good at it. Yes. Right? You'll really improve. So, you know... Sometimes things can be boring, but again, it's not about being the smartest person. It's about working hard and applying yourself. And not all of the subjects are going to be super interesting, but there are going to be subjects out there that really, really interest you. Okay, so that's number two. And number three is supporting our friends. That's pretty simple, right? Mm -hmm. But wait a second, that's one of those simple, not easy things. So when I mean supporting our friends, if they have a particular interest or a hobby, maybe it's something that seems a little bit geeky or dweeby or boring. <laughs> like bug collecting. I like bug collecting. Okay, you like bug collecting. But you don't like listening to my alien podcast. You don't want a UFO hunt with me. <laughs> oh, I'm just being silly. No, but I'm serious. Supporting our friends is very vital because that supports their interest as well, right? So again, a real simple call to actions. Number one, love this world. Love the things around you. Develop a passion for that. And when you do that, you're also going to begin to love science. Number two, commit to working hard in school. Hey, it's not about being the smartest person. It's about being the hardest working person. And number three, supporting our friends. All right, guys, that's all we've got for today. Don't forget, if you like this podcast, make sure that you subscribe, rate, review, share it with your friends. And remember, you can always get in touch with me on social media or drop me an email at universeinaseashell at gmail.com. Again, that's universeinaseashell at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening.